the level of intimacy that our Lord suggests that we regard our Father with, to call him in this way. And St. John says, says elsewhere, quote, what we shall be later is not yet clear. But when we see him, we shall be like him, for we will see him as he is. We shall be like him? Like whom? Like God? And then, of course, in Mass today, at the offertory, we all heard in our respective parishes, the priests say, by the mingling of this water and wine, may we come to share in the divinity of Christ, who humbled himself to share in our humanity, to share in his divinity. I cannot possibly express to you how shocking those statements are to a Muslim. To think that man, this creature, could somehow share in the divine life of God is an outrageous blasphemy to them. And to suggest that God himself took on a human nature is absurd beyond belief, literally. And as imams will say, if the subject comes up, God, um, God, had, God had bodily functions. God consumed and excreted. So this is just absurd and beyond the pale. Uh, so it's very important for you to know how foreign, totally foreign, these notions are within Islam. And part of this has to do with one of their doctrines of monotheism, which is called Tanzia. Tanzia. This means that this God is infinitely removed. He is infinitely transcendent. He is incomparable. He is unknowable. He is unreachable. There is nothing you can know about him but what he chooses to tell you. And in his revelation, insofar as the Quran is concerned, does he tell you who he is and what he's like? No, he doesn't. He tells you what to do. He gives you his rules. So Tanzi, this God is, is above. Don't compare him with anything. Certainly not with yourselves. Blasphemy. The famous saying within Islam is, is without asking how, bilya kefa, and without comparing. God's incomparable. Yes? Do they have any personal relationship with this God? And the answer is, um, that's next. <laughs> Do you see how I build suspense here? I'm going to hold that off till next week, so you come back. Now, the next thing, the next thing that would surprise you in the Quran is that there is no original sin. There is the first sin, but it's not any different from the second sin or the third sin or the fourth sin. What happens after this first sin in the Quran? And he, Allah, accepted his repentance. And we move on. Sometimes Allah accepts the repentance, sometimes he doesn't, but that's about it. In other words, there was no catastrophic dislocation in the relationship between man and God. No catastrophic breach, which actually sunders all of creation. As St. Paul says, all creation groans as a result of this original sin, which brought death and suffering, etc., into the world. And so what does Genesis tell us after original sin and the breach of this relationship between the Creator and His creation. We see man destitute, having nothing within his limited means to repair the relationship. How can this finite man have anything of sufficient worth to expiate his sin with this infinite God? He can't. He doesn't. So what happens next in Genesis? God says, 
you can't do this, but I will send someone who will do it for you. I will send a Savior, a Messiah. And the rest of the Old Testament contains prophecies about who this person will be, uh, what he will be like, and what he will do. In other words, that moment in Genesis begins what we call salvation history. And we in the West basically took the idea of salvation history and secularized it into history. History is a notion of a linear development of progress. That's just a secularized idea, notion of salvation history. Now in Islam, since there was no original sin, there is no promise of a Messiah, of a Savior, as a consequence of which there's no salvation history. And since there's no salvation history within Islam, there is, in a way, no history either. There was no salvation history to secularize into the notion of history as we understand it in the West. Indeed, I would suggest to you the very idea of time is different within Islam. No clocks on mosques. Some, one scholar once said, Islam's end is in its beginning. It just keeps looping back on itself. Allah said in the Quran of the community that Muhammad had formed in Medina, this is the best community. This is the best. That is why you will notice every effort at Muslim reform is always to go back. Because you have a divine definition of the best that existed at that time, uh, you should attempt to replicate this in some way. Now, there's another interesting uh, point in the Quran. Who names the animals in the Quran? Do you know? God. God names the animals. And as we know in Genesis, it's man who names the animals. This may seem like a um, interesting but not particularly pertinent point, but it is believe me, extremely powerful. Man in Genesis has the, the power to name. The power to name is the power to know. Reality, reality becomes intelligible to us through words. If I say, uh, what's that? and you don't have a, a name for it, what, how do you respond? Say, I don't know. I don't know. If you don't have a name for it, you don't know what it is. So Adam has this power over these things to name them, which means to make them intelligible to himself. Muslim man does not have this power. What does this mean? It means he doesn't have a source of knowledge within himself through this power to, to name these things. It's even goes further than that. The angels complain to Allah about making this creature man and telling them to bow down to him. So Allah decides to put the angels in, his, in their place. And this is in the second surah. And he taught Adam the names, all of them. Then he showed them to the angels and said, Inform me of the names of these if you are truthful. So he challenges the angels. Okay, you're so smart. What are these things? They said, exalted are you. We have no knowledge except what you have taught us. The angels don't know what these animals are either. Because neither do they have the power to name or know other than what God explicitly tells them. Are you with me on this one? They don't have a reason capable of apprehending reality independent of a direct revelation from God. So you see 